And inshallah, his topic is going to be, every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Amma ba'd. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an in a hadith narrated by Imam al-Bukhari in his sahih and Imam Muslim in his sahih and Abu Dawood in his tunan and a tirmidhi in his, in, his, in his al-jami' and al-musnad, Imam Ahmad's musnad and other books. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَلَا كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَلَىٰ رَعِيَّتِهِ that verily every one of you is a shepherd and every one of you is responsible for his flock. So the Imam or the leader of the Muslims is a shepherd and he is responsible for all of the Muslims. And the man is a shepherd and he is responsible for his family. And the woman is a shepherd and she is responsible for the family of her husband. And then other examples are given in other ahadith and then it is finishes by ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyyatih that every one of you is a shepherd and every one of you is responsible for his flock today's short lecture will insha'Allah ta'ala be a summary of the explanation of this hadith a hadith that I believe most of us if not all of us have heard and I want to emphasize the beauty of this hadith before I begin how beautiful is this hadith Notice the Prophet ﷺ imparted wisdom through the mechanism of a metaphor, an example, a parable. Every one of you is a shepherd. And of course, we are now living in 2014 in modern America. Most of us don't relate to a shepherd. But the concept of a shepherd is something that each and every human at the time would be intimately familiar with. Dare I say, most of the young men would actually have been a shepherd at some time in their lives. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is using an interesting teaching mechanism. And you know, there are lectures and books that are written about extracting the teaching benefits. How did the Prophet teach the Sahaba? How did the Prophet educate the Sahaba? He used examples and metaphors, such as in this hadith. He drew diagrams. Can you believe? Our Prophet drew diagrams. Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. That one day the Prophet was sitting, he took a stick and he drew a diagram. And he illustrated, this is your life, this is your death, this is your hope. So he's illustrating with a diagram. Our Prophet gave interesting questions that made people think. For example, the hadith of Abu Huraira in Sahih Bukhari that our Prophet said, imagine if one of you took a shower five times a day, do you think he'd be still dirty? So of course the Sahaba, and of course in those time and age, people generally take a shower once every two, three days. They don't have access to showers like we do. They would take a ghusl whenever they needed to. So nobody took a shower five times a day. Even us with modern luxury, we don't take showers five times a day. So they said, of course, nobody would be left with a speck of filth on his body. So then the Prophet ﷺ said, this is the example of the five salawat. Notice this is teaching mechanism here. So in this hadith, he's using the teaching mechanism of a metaphor. Every one of you is a shepherd and every one of you is responsible for his or her flock. Now, a shepherd... What exactly is a shepherd? And why is every one of us being compared to a shepherd? What is the role of a shepherd? If we understand the role of a shepherd, then we will understand the reality of this metaphor. A shepherd is a person who does not own the property he's taking care of. He does not own the sheep or the goats or the camels he's actually taking care of. Rather, he or she is accountable to somebody else for that flock. A shepherd is somebody that cares about his flock more than he cares about himself. He cares about the animals to his own safety and peril. A shepherd is somebody who knows what is better for the flock more than the flock know what is better for them. He knows what is better for the animals in his control more than the animals themselves. And similarly, he knows what is more dangerous for the animals more than the animals themselves know. A shepherd is somebody who works tirelessly for the benefit of the flock. 
A shepherd is somebody who has an immense amount of patience, an immense amount of patience, and the reward that he or she will get will not primarily be monetary. It will be the satisfaction of the flourishing of the sheep. How much is a shepherd paid? Shepherd was minimum wage. Shepherds was minimum wage. And that's why our Prophet ﷺ said, I used to be a shepherd ala qararit. Qararit is literally what we would say pennies. I would get pennies for being a shepherd. But what is the satisfaction? The shepherd sees the flourishing of the flock, sees the animals grow, the animals give forth other animals, sees the health of the flock. That is his main satisfaction. A shepherd is the one who leads the way for the animals, for the flock. And the flock is the one that follows. A shepherd is the one who searches for water, searches for pasture, searches for nourishment, and the animals follow along. A shepherd is the one who is ever alert for dangers, always aware, where is the wolf? Where is the danger going to happen? Where will something harm my flock? And the shepherd is more concerned for the safety of the flock than he is for himself. A shepherd is one who is monitoring somebody will steal or harm the flock or not. A shepherd is one who nurtures each and every individual animal according to how that animal needs to be nurtured. In other words, not all animals are the same. And anybody who has been around animals knows this. Not all horses are the same. Not all sheep are the same. For some sheep, you need a little bit of mercy. For others, you need strictness. For some sheep, they don't need to be guided. They'll follow the flock. Others, they are independent. They're going to go their way. They have to be guided in the front. The shepherd knows how every single sheep, how every single animal is, and then deals with that individual person or animal according to the mizaj, according to the temperament of that animal. A shepherd is one who will literally go after a lost sheep, run after that sheep in order to bring it back to the flock. A shepherd won't just sit back and say, oh well, tough luck, the sheep is gone, it's not my fault the sheep ran away. No, the shepherd is more concerned about the safety, the sanctity of the entire flock than he is about himself. And a shepherd is more happy at the return of a lost sheep than he is even at a personal gain or fortune. A shepherd is more happy when a lost or misguided sheep comes back to the flock than he is at a personal fortune. A shepherd is one who shows patience, perseverance, care, mercy, long-term vision for very little worldly benefits. And therefore, it is not a coincidence that our Prophet ﷺ said, مَا بَعَثَ اللَّهُ مِن نَبِيٍّ Our Prophet ﷺ said, Never did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send a prophet except that he was a shepherd in his young age. Now the Sahaba, the Prophet ﷺ said this, he's 60, 62 years old. He is now the undisputed head of Arabia. Some of most of the Sahaba of Medina, they've never seen him other than a leader. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, wala ant? Even you were a shepherd? They did not know the Prophet when he was 16 years old. They didn't know him as a young man 50 years ago in Mecca. So they said, not even you, Ya Rasulullah. You were also a shepherd. And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, I too was a shepherd. I used to take care of some of the sheep of the people of Mecca ala qararit, for pennies, pennies that they would give me. Why? Because being a shepherd is a necessary precondition. The characteristics that shepherds have are characteristics that all the prophets have to have. The characteristics that a shepherd has is a characteristic that every successful leader has to have. And so every prophet was sent as a shepherd. And that's why our Prophet ﷺ also gave this example that every one of you is a shepherd and every one of you is responsible for his or her flock. Now, in today's lecture, we're only going to talk about primarily the two uh, examples that he gave, but he started the hadith by saying the first example, and that is the example of the imam. And the imam here means the khalifa. The imam here means the sultan al-a'zam. The imam, he, imam here means the grand leader of the Muslim world. So our Prophet ﷺ said, the imam is a shepherd and he is responsible for the entire nas. He said, all people. Now, this is really interesting because how many imams does the Muslim community have, theoretically? How many imams should be in the Muslim community? How many khalifas should be in the Muslim community? One. 
And yet he begins this hadith with the example that is only relevant to one human being at one given time. So he begins the example by illustrating it through something that is so rare in the Muslim world. These days, unfortunately, we don't even have one. But for most of our ummah, we had a khalifa. So the first phrase of the hadith is applicable to how many millions of people? Literally one person. And yet he begins it with that example. Why? Well, for many reasons. First and foremost, because, yes indeed, it might be rare to be an imam. Yes indeed, only one person in the world can be an imam. But that imam needs to know that he is not above the law. That imam needs to know that he too, no matter how grand the palace he's living in, no matter how much wealth he actually owns, no matter how much is his, uh, is his personal gain, still he is a shepherd and there is a master above him. And that master will question him about his flock, even if his flock is the entire Muslim kingdom, even if his flock is the entire khilafah, even if his flock spans from Andalus to China. Still, it's not his. He is but a shepherd. And the master will ask him, even the khalifa, even the sultan, even the imam al-a'zam, is nothing but a shepherd in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is only one true Rabb and everyone else is under that Rabb. As Allah says in the Quran, that in kullu man fis samawati wa radhi illa atir rahmani abda. Every single person in the heavens and earth will come as an abd in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single kullu man fis samawati wal ard will come on that day as an abd in front of Allah. There is no master other than the real malik. There is no malik other than that malikul muluk. There is no real ruler. And that is why on the day of judgment that Allah azza wa jal will ask liman al mulkul yawm to whom does the kingdom belong today? And not a single voice will have the audacity to respond. So Allah will respond to himself. So the reason why it begins with the imam is that the imam needs to know. Also another reason why it begins with the imam is that for the imam, if anybody would have an exception, it would be the ruler. But the ruler himself does not have an exception. If anybody were to have an exception of not being under authority, of not being responsible, of having full carte blanche authority, it would be the most powerful man in the world. But our Prophet ﷺ did not make an exception even for the Khalifa. If even the Khalifa does not have an exception, then how can I have an exception? How can you have an exception? Another reason for beginning the examples with the example of the Imam is it is illustrative of the rest of the people who will follow. The Imam, the Imam has pretty much carte blanche authority. The Imam represents, if you like, the Sharia, represents, if you like, the religion of Allah on earth. And generally speaking, the rule of the world, generally speaking, is that no one is as powerful as the leader. No one has more authority than the leader. And similarly, we are being told that every one of us, there are people under our, our authority. Perhaps the law is not aware. Perhaps nobody else knows how we treat the inner sanctity of our house. Perhaps nobody outside, even our neighbors, are not aware of how we treat our own children. We do have a similar type of authority. How the husband treats his wife. Wallahi, how many are the couples? Even close friends don't know how the husband mistreats and abuses the wife. How many are the people that even the neighbors are not aware that the children are terrified of their own parents? The children are intimidated. The children are treated in a harsh and cruel manner. So our Prophet is illustrating, you know, yes, there might be only one ultimate Sultan, but at some level, every one of us has some authority over somebody in our lives. Whether it's the boss, whether it's the CEO, whether it is the uh, person who is in charge of any affair of the ministry, whether it is a husband over the wife and children, whether it is the mother over her own children, at some level, at some point in our lives, every one of us has authority over others. 
So what is our process of reminding us? Even the Sultan doesn't get a green pass. Even he is responsible. So when you become Sultan with a small s, small scene, does it work? When you become Sultan with a small s, when you become in charge over others, realize that the real Sultan doesn't get a green pass. How are you going to get a green pass? The real Khalifa is not going to be let off the hook. How do you think you're going to be let off the hook? So he begins with this beautiful example of the Sultan for all of these reasons. Then he gives us other examples. And in today's lecture, we'll only mention uh, two, the, the, the other two examples. And then the, the hadith concludes with sometimes one, sometimes two examples. We're not going to get to them today. The, the next two examples that are given in every version of the hadith is that of the father and the mother, or what can, one can say of the husband and the wife. So immediately after the Khalifa, and I want you to imagine this. When you're giving a general lecture that is meant for all of society, one would think begin with the ruler, then move on to the ministers, then move on to the government bodies, then move on to the police, then move on to this, then move on to that. In this hadith, right after mentioning the Khalifa, who's the immediate next? The father and then the mother. Or we can say the husband and the wife, because in this hadith, the, ro the role is dual. The father slash husband, the mother slash wife. The role is dual here. Out of all of the functions of society, I mean, to be honest, even if he mentioned the blacksmith, if he mentioned the cobble trader, if he mentioned the seller, it's all legit, it's all valid. In the end of the day, society needs all of these people. But out of all professions and trades, he mentions two of them. The mother and, and sorry, the husband slash father and the mother slash wife. Why? Why these two? Number one, because of the importance of the mother and father. Because of the status of the husband and wife. And number two, because of the universality of these professions. Not everybody is a businessman. I don't buy and sell too much. Not everybody is a cobbler. Not everybody is a, a whatever profession. But the majority of human beings at some point in their lives become husband or wife, become mother or father. It is universal. And then number three, that every single other profession is based upon that of the family. The building block of society is the family. The building block of society is the family. If the family is sound, the values of the businessman raised from this beautiful and sound household will be sound. If the family is sound, the doctor that comes from this family, the engineer that comes from this family, the car mechanic that comes from this family, his or her values will be sound. And therefore, we concentrate. Our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, concentrated on the mother and father. Out of all of the roles, from the Khalifa, you jump immediately to the mother and father. From the Sultan, you jump immediately to the husband and wife. Why? Because if they do their job, the rest of society fits into place. If the solid foundation is there, the building block, that is really the basic Lego piece. That's the basic building block. If you have this one Lego piece solid, all of the other pieces will stack up. But if that piece is not solid, then the rest of them are going to crumble. So what did our Prophet say? So the man is a shepherd. And he is responsible for ahli baytihi, for the family his family, and the woman is a shepherd, and she is responsible for the bait of her husband. Notice, husband and wife, man and woman, mother and father, guess what? Their responsibilities overlap. The exact same word is used, ahl and bait. It's not as if it's two different spheres. The mother and father are both responsible for the same flock. Think about that. The same word is used. The, the, the flock is so important. Now typically, by the way, typically a, 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 a group of sheep, a flock basically, has one shepherd. Typically, one person is enough to handle even a lot of sheep. That's the standard rule. But the family is so important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the family with two shepherds. The family is so important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the rajul and the mar'a, the man and the woman, the both of them are responsible for the bait. 
And the same word is used, the ahl. The same word is used. Why? Because this flock is too important. You know the average flock of sheep is like 100, 150. Well, mashallah, tabarakallah, the average family is not 100. The average family is what? Two, three, four, five? But that is so precious. It is so precious. Allah Azza wa Jal blessed this flock with two shepherds. That's how important it is. And each one of them has a role. And by mentioning the husband first, there is no doubt. As Allah says in the Quran, nisa. Men are the caretakers, men are the protectors, men are the providers. Qawwam has many meanings, and of the meanings of Qawwam, they are responsible for. Al Qa'imu ala shay, he is the one who's responsible for. So by mentioning the husband first, because in the end of the day, the husband has to pay the bills. It's not the wife that has to do that. The husband has to do whatever is the final decision. Yes, the wife is the modicum of respect. Yes, Jannah is under the feet of the mother, but two people cannot steer the ship, two people cannot drive the car. And in the end of the day, when push comes to shove, it is a truth. Whether one swallows this or not, it is the reality. Only one person can drive the ship or drive the car and that is nisa. and in the end of the day that man will be responsible on yom al qiyamah listen to this husbands you will be responsible for your wife and your family more than your wife will be responsible for you and the children this is this comes with with respond with this privilege comes responsibility with this rank also comes responsibility on the day of judgment and so the prophet mentions the man first and therefore, it is the duty of every man to take care of his flock. And the same goes for the woman. The duty of the woman as well to take care of her own flock. Now, how do they do this? Subhanallah, where does one begin? But go back to the role of the shepherd. Go back to what does a shepherd do? A shepherd understands that the flock in front of him or her, this is not my possession. I don't own my kids. Allah is the only malik. Allah is the only owner. He is Malik and he is Malik. He is the king and he is the owner. It's not my ownership. These children are a gift that Allah has given me. This family is a gift that Allah will ask me about. He has gifted it for me as long as I'm alive and as long as they are alive. When I return or if they return, this is Allah's right. Whomever he wants to take first. The general rule, the parents go first. But sometimes the children go first. And the parents then have to accept, this is not mine in the first place. It was the property of Allah. And Allah has the right to take his property whenever he pleases. So the parent realizes, this is not my ownership. I have to take the best interest of the flock. And I have to be accountable to the owner. When the shepherd comes back, the owner will ask him, do you have all of the sheep? Are all they well fed? Everything taken care of? Similarly, when we return to Allah, Allah will ask us about our family. Did you take care of your family? Did you nourish them physically and spiritually? Was the food that you gave them halal or haram? Wallahi brothers, especially brothers, how can any person want to give filthy food to his children. Think about it. If a food has some, some, some uh, petrification on it, some dirtiness on it, if the food has become stale, if the food has become rotten and spoiled, would you give it to your son or daughter? You would jump up and say, no, 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 don't eat, this is bad. How then, where is your conscience when you earn money through haram and you then buy them the most luxurious items. Wallahi, do you not realize that feeding your, mon your, your children through haram money is worse than feeding them filthy and rotten food? Feeding your wife and child through haram money is more damaging to their iman in the long run than giving them rotten food. You're responsible. Like if the shepherd took the sheep to some dirty water, to some filthy water, the sheep fell ill. It is the shepherd who's responsible. And the owner will call the shepherd to task. So every one of us needs to be conscious of this. As well, the role of the shepherd is what? The shepherd knows what is good for the flock better than the flock knows what is good for itself. The sheep might want to wander into a dangerous area. And the shepherd says, no, you can't do that. Out of love for the sheep, out of love for the animals, in the case of the parents, out of love for their children, they must show at times strictness and at times mercy. Similarly, the shepherd is the one who leads the way. 
The shepherd searches for genuine nourishment and there is no nourishment more important than spiritual nourishment. So if you truly want your children to take you as their shepherd, dear fathers and dear mothers, you must be their role models. You must lead the way, not just physically, metaphorically, spiritually. How do you expect your children to be good Muslims when they hear and see you backbiting, backstabbing, yelling, screaming at one another? How do you expect your children's marriages to be successful when your own marriages are not successful? How do you expect your children to be merciful when they don't see that mercy in you? You really want to be a shepherd for your children? Lead the way in your own characteristics, in your own manners. Go forward in a way that your children will genuinely take you as role models. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Brothers and sisters, I was born in this land. I was born in the mid 70s. I'm of the first generation that was born here. I have witnessed dozens, hundreds of young men and women come of age of my generation. Listen to my words carefully. I have not witnessed a single case, not one, of a young man or woman born here whose parents were genuinely religious with a good, healthy Islamic house, except that eventually, and that's the key word, such a child comes back to the religion as a young man or woman. I say eventually because many times the child might wander away. And I've seen this all too often. Many times, especially at the young age, 18 to 25, it's very common for a young man or woman to get lost. It's very common to go off the path. Right? But from my own experiences as a young man born and raised here, seeing the second generation come of age, I don't know in my immediate and extended family and acquaintances of any child whose parents were genuinely good role models. Yes, there were plenty that were not so good role models. Yes, there were plenty who gave an outward aura of being good, but inside the house we know what was happening. Inside the house, we know the realities. Such children, yes, it is possible. And I know, astaghfirullah, but this is a reality of a number of murtad cases in the extended acquaintances as I've grown up. This is the reality you have to face. A number of our children have left the religion. I know of many of them who have stopped practicing. I know of many who have nothing to do with Islam. But I go back to my point. If the parents were genuinely loving, the environment of the house was an Islamic environment, then I have seen young teenagers go astray. I have seen men and women fall into major haram. But when they come older, they get married. And especially, especially when they have their own children. That is really the demarcation. That's really when you see the inner iman come out. A, a young man can be evil for a, young, for a period of time. A young woman can go astray. But when they have their own children, what happens? If there is an ounce of iman left in them, all of a sudden they rediscover the faith. And they replicate the faith they found in their houses growing up. They try to embody the values that they were familiar with, even if they made fun of those values when they were 18, 19, 20. Listen to this carefully. Why? Because the shepherd was successful in showing the guidance to the sheep. And when the sheep eventually, in this case, will become the shepherd, right? The young boy becomes the shepherd. The young boy now becomes the man with his own family. Then he understands where to get water. He understands where to go for comfort and support. He understands how to take care of the flock. Even if he gets lost in the process, when he or she becomes the shepherd, they know the realities of Islam. So if you really want to be a successful shepherd, then you need to lead the way yourself. You need to be out in the forefront and you need to be genuinely a role model to your children. Also, as we said, the shepherd understands the mizaj, the temperament of the different, uh, you know, in this case, sheep uh, and in the other case, the family. Not every child is dealt with in the same manner. In some cases, harshness works. In the majority of cases, tenderness works. Rarely, yes, there are exceptions. Generally speaking, generally speaking, mercy wins. Once in a while, harshness is also needed. But the general rule, as our Prophet ﷺ said, never is tenderness and mercy added to something except that it makes it more beautiful. And never is harshness and strictness added to something except that it makes it, it disfigures it. It, it loses its beauty. But yes, sometimes you have to be harsh for the longer mercy. When do you do that? You, if you are a true shepherd, if you're a good shepherd, you know, when should I hit the sheep? 
One should I, you know, guide them harshly and one should I be merciful to them. As a parent, you know, one should you rebuke and one should you should be merciful. You have to treat each child differently according to the mizaj or the background of the child. And of the characteristics of the shepherd, we said what? Is that he is more overjoyed when a lost sheep comes back than he is at a personal gain, at a personal fortune. When a child goes astray, never close all the doors upon that child. Never. And I have seen many times that a child will go astray and the family is so embarrassed. And you know the sad thing? The sad thing. They are more embarrassed at what people will say and think than they are hurt at the loss of Islam. They're more embarrassed about their personal reputation and izzah. What will people say? Then they are genuinely at losing the child. So when this false sense of bravado comes on, they shut all the doors. We want to have nothing to do with this child. By child, I mean 18, 19, 20, young man or woman. What do you think is going to happen? This is America. It's a free country. You really think he needs you when he's 18, 19? He's going to go away completely. If you're going to be so harsh towards him, then you've shut all doors. What's going to happen? I suggest to every family that when there is such a crisis and there are such crises that the child really goes, the young man or woman really goes out of hand, does a major haram. I suggest the family comes together and has, plays good cop, bad cop. Some of the relatives show some harshness and some relative always allows an avenue back. Who those relatives are will vary from family to family. But you know best. But what I am saying, never burn all your bridges. Never cut off all connections. If a young man or woman really has done something that is completely unacceptable, living with a person of the opposite gender in a haram relationship, or doing something really that we cannot tolerate, we have to speak out. Some people show harshness. But there should always be an entrance left back to the house. There should always be, look, if you give up your ways, repent, Allah will forgive you and we will accept you back. And I have seen myself that when the family closes all avenues, the, the young man or woman leaves everything. And when the family allows some hope, then some connection remains and some hope remains. So too the shepherd. The shepherd is more happy at the return of the lost sheep than at a personal gain. Similarly, the, the, the true parent will be more happy at the return of the child than even at a personal uh, gain. And realize here, my dear brothers and sisters, that subhanAllah, and this is a sad note to come to the conclusion on, but it is true, the best of shepherds sometimes lose their sheep. The best of shepherds, they do everything they can. But in the end of the day, there are factors beyond their control. Parents, if you've done your best, and there's much that can be done, dua and tarbiyah and good environment, if you've done your best, then in the end of the day, you must leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not every successful parent will have a successful child. Console yourself with the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Console yourself with the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Can anybody say that Nuh alayhi salam was not an ideal father? Can anybody accuse Nuh of astaghfirullah doing something wrong? Yet in the end of the day, there's only so much you can do because you are not the master and controller. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are only the shepherd. You try your best. You do what you can, but in the end of the day, that is an individual animal or an individual offspring with a mind of his own, a will of his own. There's only so much you can do. And so, no doubt, you do your best. You make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You show them the way, but in the end, if it's not successful and you have done your job, then realize there's only so much that you can do and take consolation in those before you. Not every single person will be guided. And as, Allah, as our Prophet ﷺ said, you cannot, as Allah says to the Prophet ﷺ, you do not have the power to guide those whom you love. It's not in our hands. Yet, insha'Allah ta'ala, we see as well, and with this positive note we'll conclude, the general rule 
is that if you do your job and you put in the effort and you're a good shepherd, the flock will be successful. The general rule is that if you have a hundred sheep, the bulk of them will be successful. The general rule that we have seen living in this society, good parents that are good shepherds, good parents that embody all of these characteristics, their families, alhamdulillah, are successful families. And that is why our Prophet ﷺ, to reiterate this point, he began the hadith with the same phrase, he ended it. Ala kullukum ra'in. Every one of you is a shepherd and every one of you is responsible for his or her flock. My dear brothers and sisters, in this beautiful hadith, our Prophet used poetic imagery, he used symbolism, he used a mechanism and a manner that would appeal to every human at the time. He used an imagery that is so powerful and profound, the imagery of a shepherd. He used a language and he demonstrated for us the reality of being a caretaker. He emphasized the importance of the family out of all all of the roles after the Khalifa he mentioned the father and the mother he mentioned the husband and the wife to reiterate to emphasize that the most important thing of any society is the family brothers and sisters we can't solve all the problems in the world we can't solve Guantanamo we can't solve Syria we can't solve Palestine our duas go out for them but you know what we do have an immediate and direct impact on our family especially our children we are all shepherds we're only responsible for our flock I'm not responsible for other people's flocks. I wish the best for them. I pray for them. But in the end of the day, I am responsible for my family and flock. And you are responsible for your family and, flo and flock. And this is of the mercy of the Sharia. La yukallifullahu nafsan illa wus'aha. You are only responsible for your own immediate circle of influence. And therefore, do what you can with ihsan. Follow this hadith to the best of your abilities. And realize that if you put in the effort, the general rule, the sunnah of Allah, you will see the results in this world before the akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless each and every one of us with righteous families. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow our sons and daughters to become the coolness of our eyes and the sweetness of our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make iman beloved to our children and make iman beautify the hearts of our children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our children love the Quran more than they love anything else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us role models for our children and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us and our progeny after us of those who pray and establish the salah as Ibrahim prayed when building the Kaaba may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us to live as Muslims and to die as mu'mins and to be resurrected with the Anbiya and the Nabiyin and the Siddiqin and the Shuhada and the Salihin وحسن أولئك رفيقا وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة رحمة الله وبركاته. جزاك الله خير شيخ ياسر. ما شاء الله. The energy he has after traveling over 10,000 miles in the last couple of days. جزاك الله خير for that. Uh, just a quick reminder. Um, you can follow us on. You can like us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also watch this event um, online. It's being streamed live. So if you have family members or friends that couldn't make it, please send them a message. Uh, they can watch us on uh, youtube.com slash ikna, and they can follow the discussion there as well, inshallah. Salat al-Maghrib is going to be at 8.20 downstairs, and inshallah, after that, the next session in this hall is going to be at 10.15, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.